Section 9 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey. From the Easy Chair, Volume 1, by George William Curtis. Section 9. Honestus at the Caucus. A man who is easily discouraged, who is not willing to put the good seed out of sight and wait for results, who desponds if he cannot obtain everything at once, and who thinks the human race lost if he is disappointed, will be very unhappy if he persists in taking a part in politics. There is no sphere in which self-deception is easier. A man with a restless personal ambition is very apt to believe his own purposes to be public ends, and he finds his party to be recreant to its principles if he fails to get what he wants. A young man comes from college, carefully trained, with the taste for politics which belongs to the English race, and with the wish and hope to distinguish himself and to serve his country. He attaches himself to a party and works for it in the usual way, waiting for his opportunity and his distinction. Gradually, the gratification of his ambition becomes his test of the patriotic sincerity and wisdom of the party. He does not think that it is so. He does not state it to himself in that bald way, but he feels that he is the kind of man that his party ought to promote, that he has the capacity and the desire to be of use, and that if his party has not perceptions sharp enough to know its own best men, nor the wish to distinguish them by calling them to office, there is something deplorable in its condition. I am afraid, said a gentleman of this kind to the easy chair, that my party is falling into bad hands. I see signs of corruption which seem to me very disheartening. He shook his head forebodingly. This gentleman did not conceal his opinion. He announced it freely, and the rumour came to the ears of the real managers of the party. They put their heads together, and presently the foreboding gentleman was called to a public position. Again the easy chair met him, and he said that the political prospect was very much more encouraging than he had ever known it to be. There was a spirit abroad, he thought, which would certainly lead to great results. Indeed, the clouds were gone, and the sun shone brightly. At another time, another gentleman shook his head in the same way. He held a pleasant position, but he found that promotion was very slow, and he began to despond and to think the time sadly demoralized, and his party, at least he feared it, fatally mercenary. It was evidently indifferent to reform, and seemed to care little for the wishes of the people or the character of the country. He, too, shook his head with profound distrust for the future, and the easy chair fell into deep depression and wondered whether, after all, a republican form of government might not be a failure. Before it was possible to say so conclusively, however, the chair heard that his friend had decided to seek reform and the welfare of the race, quote, under the banner, end quote, of the opposing party. And again, while considering whether all patriots ought not to follow so eminent an example, it learned that the desponding soul, who had had the courage to face obloquy and change his party relations, had only done so after prolonged and fruitless efforts to secure official place under his old party. Had he obtained it, that party would still have seemed to him resolute, patriotic and discerning, and he would have continued to serve his country in the association to which he had become accustomed. There is no South American general who overthrows a government and enthrones himself as dictator upon the ruins who does not announce with imposing solemnity that the old system was intolerable and that the interests of humanity and the country required him to do as he had done. Not one of them was ever known to declare that he had destroyed the old government because he wished to be the government himself. The two friends of the easy chair had sincerely sophisticated themselves and identified their personal advantage and wishes with the public interest. If they had told the precise truth, they would have said that they wanted office, and if they could not get it from one party, they would try another. When a man is conscious of a strong desire and of great ability to serve the public, this kind of sophistication is easy. That which should make a generous man suspicious under such circumstances is that he confounds official position with public service. 
the latter indeed is in a sense a technical phrase but a man may equally serve the public unofficially by taking his part in the necessary and disagreeable details of practical politics if he will not do this he must share the responsibility of bad government yet here again he must not be discouraged if his efforts appear to be abortive and the results ridiculous the secret of a republic seems abstractly to be very simple for it is merely that all good men shall act together and elect good officers but good men cannot act together if they do not think together and the best method of obtaining results which all desire is the very problem of politics all good men cannot act together therefore because good men differ but even the good men who agree cannot easily and simply have their own way because political measures can be secured only by organization and the organization or the machine by which the result is to be attained may very readily fall into crafty or corrupt hands which will use the sincerity and pure purpose of better men to serve base and mercenary ends the first of the two friends of the easy chair was used in this manner he was sincere and pure but he was vain and therefore weak and the clever managers hit him in the heel again a man may be wholly free of weakness or vanity and without the least personal wish or ambition in public life may take part in politics solely from a commanding sense of duty and yet find himself and his efforts not only unavailing for his own purposes but ludicrously and hopelessly perverted to serve those of others honestus was such a man in the truest sense a patriot in feeling yet he confessed that he had hitherto neglected his political duties but declared that henceforth he would lose no opportunity of correcting his conduct he saw with joy the notice of an approaching primary meeting and when the evening arrived he hastened to the hall with the pleasing consciousness that he was discharging a great public duty he reached the hall and was heartily welcomed by the observant managers whom had titbottom's spectacles been at hand he would have seen to be foxes at least they were very glad indeed to see honestus and men like him engaging in politics they saw in that fact the augury of a better day it was a peculiar pleasure to cooperate with him and they trusted that this was but the beginning of a good habit upon his part honestus could not help thinking how easy it was to exaggerate and to suppose men to be a great deal worse than they are and wondered that he had never before taken the trouble or rather fulfilled the duty of attending the primary meeting the proceedings began and he was exceedingly interested officers were appointed and it was evident from their speeches that nothing but honesty and economy was to be sought and only men of the most spotless character nominated but it was necessary to have a committee upon nominations and to his surprise and gratification honestus heard his own name mentioned as one of the committee and almost blushed as he was appointed its chairman the committee was requested to withdraw and to report the names of candidates as soon as possible honestus and his colleagues therefore retired to a dim passageway where as he subsequently remarked he should have been rather alarmed to meet either of them at night and alone and business began various names were mentioned of which unfortunately honestus had never heard one and at length one of the most positive of the committee said emphatically that upon the whole sly was the very man for the place there was a general murmur of assent and satisfaction honestus heard on every side that it was just the thing that sly was an avon boy and that he was always there he was also square and right up to the line and by common consent sly seemed to be the heaven appointed candidate rather disturbed by his total ignorance of this conspicuous public character honestus turned to his neighbor and said guardedly with the air of a man who was musing upon sly's qualifications oh sly sly yes said his neighbor sly certainly replied honestus certainly but who is sly his neighbor looked at him for a moment and repeated the question in a tone of incredulity who is sly as if he had said who is george washington yes i don't think that i know him don't know sly no well if you did know him you'd know that he is just the man we want bang up made for it 
Oh, is he? You bet. A1. Well, said the member who had first announced that Sly was a very man for the place, I suppose they'll be waiting. I nominate Sly as a candidate. The chairman said yes, but that, unfortunately for himself, he did not know Mr. Sly. Well, you don't know anything against him, do you? asked the other. Certainly not. Well, we all know him, and he is the very man. We ought to hurry. Honestus put the question, and Sly was unanimously named as the candidate to be reported to the meeting by the chairman. The meeting was already stamping and clapping and calling for the committee, and the energetic mover of Sly said it was necessary to go in right away. The committee made for the hall, and the chairman followed. He knew nothing of Sly, nor of the people who had named him, and he knew nobody else whom he could propose for the place. Honestus felt very much as a leaf might feel upon the fall at Niagara, and in the next moment the chairman of the meeting was asking him if the committee were ready to report. The chairman of the committee bowed. The chairman of the meeting said that the report would now be made. Honestus stated that he was instructed to report the name of Sly. The meeting roared. There was some thumping by the chairman, and Honestus heard only the name of Sly, and, by acclamation, and a whirlwind of calls upon Sly, Sly, speech, speech. The next moment, Sly, with a large diamond pin, was upon the platform, thanking and promising, and the meeting was stormily cheering and adjoining sine die. Honestus walked quietly home, perceiving that the result of his practical effort to discharge the primary duties of a citizen was that Sly, one of the most disreputable and dishonest of public sharks, had been nominated by a committee of which he was chairman, and that the whole weight of the name of Honestus was thrown upon the side of rascality with a diamond pin. And he reflected that in politics, as elsewhere, it is necessary to begin as early in preparation for action as the rascals. Yet he did not lose his faith, nor suppose that popular government is a cheat and a snare, because he had been involuntarily made the instrument of knaves. Honestus understands that good government is one of the best things in the world, and he knows that good things of that kind are not cheap. He is willing to pay the price, and the price is the trouble to ascertain who Sly is, and the time to do his part in defeating Sly. For Honestus knows that if he does not rule, Sly will. End of section 9